So tonight we have a panel of wonderful interior designers. Are you Sarah? I'm sorry? Are you Sarah? No, no I'm okay. not. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Deb Larson is here. She's with, she has interior environments. Um, Jeff Morrison from CTA Architects is here. And then we have Rain Terrell and Sky Anderson from Pearson Design Group. And we had um, Sarah Scope on this. It has the art company, SKS Art Company, and she got delayed on a plane. So we all hope that she finally gets off that plane sometime. And if she makes it, she might be here a little bit late. But if you guys want to, I'll turn the thing off so you can sit there. We're going to open it up for questions. Actually, first of all, we're going to let these guys introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about the, themselves, their company, and how they got there. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 um, my name is Deb Larson. Um, you might have seen the acronyms after my name. Um, I'm a professional member of the American Society of Interior Designers. I'm also the only professional member of the Retail Design Institute in Montana. I have done nothing but um, practice commercial interior design for almost 25 years. And commercial interior design means that I've done everything but homes. Um, I've done everything from churches to bars and actually at the same time, which meant I had to keep my notes straight. But um, <laughs> it's a lot of fun and I really enjoy it because no two projects are the same. Um, as far as education, uh, I started out at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. I'm actually a Hoosier and um, decided after two years of accounting that that wasn't it and um, switched to interior design, went to Harrington Institute in Chicago for three years, um, where I got an associate degree and then went on to complete general studies for a bachelor's degree. Um, so that was a long time ago. Um, then I went out, I wasn't sure what kind of design I wanted to do, which is very typical and totally fine, by the way, because it's hard to know until you're out there. Um, went to work for a residential firm and didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. And on a fluke, I went to work for an office furniture dealer, and they said, well, we just bought a computer, and we bought this program called AutoCAD, and sit down and figure it out. <laughs> and um, it was version two. <laughs> so um, when, when it was DOS and not Windows, so I'm really, really old, like ancient that way. Um, <laughs> So uh, the good news was I totally loved it. My husband says I kind of straddle the left brain, right brain thing. And I love um, space planning and creating uh, work environments for people. I got pretty passionate about the fact that when it comes to a work environment, I'm designing a space that maybe somebody will spend the next 15 or 20 years in. So I think that's really important. That's important work that we're doing as designers. And from that point, I worked for office furniture dealer for many years in different parts of the country. And then I wanted to try something new. And when I first got out of college, uh, it was a recession of 82. And so I couldn't find a job. Um, and I ended up going to work for a department store. And they promoted me into the furniture department and then into the buyer's department. And long story short, I ended up in their home store as a buyer. So the full circle part on that came. And I, it distressed me incredibly because it wasn't what I went to school for. But the full circle part on that came years later when I interviewed with an architecture firm who did nothing but retail stores, and they designed Disney stores, Williams Sonoma's, Pottery Barns, stores all over the country. And not only did I have the design background that they were looking for, I had been a retailer. And so that clinched the deal. So I'm just using that as an example of don't stress that you might not exactly land where you think you're going to right off the bat because things have a way of coming around that way. <coughs> Um, so I've been in Bozeman for 16 years. I have my own firm, and I continue to specialize in commercial interior design. I'm a big lighting nerd, and um, I just enjoy and love what I do because I feel like I'm a tool in the toolbox for small businesses to help them succeed. Um, and I enjoy making work environments better for the businesses that I work for there. And, and so that's probably the five-minute take on that. There's lots of questions I'm sure we'll be talking about. My name is Jeff Morrison. I'm with CTA Architects Engineers. Uh, CTA is the largest A&E firm in the region. Um, I uh, started there in uh, '89 in, in the buildings office, and then uh, transferred over here. And I think it was 2003. Um, to step back a little bit before that, uh, where I started was uh, um, when I was in school. Before my last year, I had to do an internship, and I had an opportunity. And I and I kind of wanted. I had just uh, um, I had just gotten married about that time, and so 
my wife was from Billings, I was from Northern Wyoming, and so we wanted to, we thought we could save some money and uh, ended up in Billings. Um, I uh, interviewed around a little bit to see if I could get an internship. And I, I had two of them that I could have grabbed and um, uh, I felt like I could do some good things with, but the one guy was talking about I would help paint his house part of the time. And, um, but the third guy I talked to, um, he intrigued me. He wasn't willing to give me a job or an internship, but he was talking about how he was working on the Old Faithful Inn in Yellowstone Park. And I thought, uh, gosh, working, working with this guy to be able to work on Yellowstone Park stuff, that's, 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 uh, that's, right, that's right up there working with Disney, like uh, Deb was able to do. I thought that was uh, pretty good stuff. And so I thought about it for a day or two, and I went back to him and I said, you know, I, uh, can I just work for you for free? Can I just come and be your grunt for the summer and um, work for free? Uh, knowing full well that that wasn't going to gain me any uh, money for the coming semesters, um, I felt like that was a good thing to do. So I, I did that, and after about three weeks, he said, you know what, I didn't realize how many loose ends we needed tied up around here. So he did end up paying me. As I go through my last year of school, um, he called me up and, while well, I was in class and, and my teacher pulls me out of class and, and uh, says, I want to you know, offer you a job. I've got another big Yellowstone Park project coming up. I'm, I'd like you to be a part of my team. And I was just ecstatic because I, you know, I just thought that was great work. And, um, um, and, and, and during my internship, um, just to point out an interesting thing that you may, you may or may not have witnessed before, but uh, it, it was such a high-profile, uh, detail-oriented job that they, they actually built a mock-up inside of a warehouse of a building. So they built a, a hotel room, freestanding, just inside of a, a warehouse. And, and then they had three different furniture manufacturers bring in their product, reset it up in each venue, take pictures, let all the uh, owners group walk through, and then make decisions on the overall design. So my internship, I just thought, was awesome. Um, I was so excited to be able to, to potentially go back and work for this guy. Um, and then as the, uh, at, once I got out of school, which was only two months later, I went back to see if that opportunity was still there, excited to get going, and, and he was all of a sudden very cold about things, and, and a month or two later found out that he uh, was going through a divorce, and they were splitting their business, and he was kind of reevaluating the situation. So that didn't work out. I felt like at that time, um, I had just got this degree. Um, I had other interests, building and a few things, and I thought, you know, I really want to put this degree to work um, and give it a good shot, so, so I'm just going to get whatever I can get. Um, I ended up getting a job with a, uh, basically a flooring store in Cody, Wyoming. Um, I worked there for a year just looking for other opportunities. Um, Ended up with a with an opportunity at a, uh, a high-end furniture showroom in Billings about a year later, and was their designer for about five years. In that process, um, even though I wasn't doing some of the commercial work, the retail and hospitality that I was really interested in, um, uh, that helped me get a foot in the door to be able to do some of that work later on. Um, I, I learned some about flooring and how it's installed and how it's made and what's um, how it's measured and and ordered in the one job and the next job I learned uh, a lot about space planning and furniture and residential application I learned uh, a lot about the entire residential process um, through uh, many prey homes um, while I was in that building market and then and then I kept Applying at my current employer, I, I, I tried uh, I think three times. They were the, the largest uh, firm in Billings, and I knew that they had 
two or three designers on staff and that there might be some opportunities. I checked with other firms as well. Um, but finally I got an in with uh, an employee there that uh, let me know of an opportunity that was opening. So this, my point with some of that detail is just if you're really interested in a certain area, uh, to keep trying and, and heading towards the, the avenues that you really want to pursue. And and value the experiences you're getting, whether it's a you know commercial um, furniture dealer or a residential showroom, um, or and that might be where you want to be anyway. You know, it could be a cabinet shop that you're detailing <coughs> piece work. Um, but take take those and and uh, use those experiences because they're always going to benefit you. The more the more you can put in um, over time, the better off you are. So. So anyway, I, I, uh, the opportunity with CTA where I'm currently at was they were starting to do some mo uh, several assisted living projects which are along the lines of hospitality. Um, they tend to be more of a residential uh, interior and they wanted someone with that type of experience and that's what I built was residential experience. So uh, that actually got a foot in the door and since then I've uh, continued to, I always have a little bit of residential going, but but my uh, because of the nature of the firm and the work that's brought in um, that flows to me, it tends to be more commercial, so I, I continue to have a, I feel like a pretty good mix. And that's where I'm at now. I'm Rain Terrell, I'm from originally at State New York, and I grew up um, in the same year, my family had a furniture store, so I've been around furniture my entire life. Um, I went to High Point University in North Carolina, and I have a Bachelor of Science degree in interior design. Um, I worked the market every year when I was there, and I used to buy when I was with my parents um, in their store also. So um, I moved to Arizona after I graduated and looked for a job in interior design. Um, it was the summer there. Hires in the summer in Arizona because nobody moves there in the summer. Um, so, anyways, I ended up uh, coming across a design center and decided to try to get a job there. And it was the most invaluable experience I've ever had. Um, I worked there for a couple of years, three years. Went to work for a design firm in Scottsdale after that. Um, and then when the economy started to quiver a little bit in Arizona, um, I in the, I guess, in the design market, I went back to another showroom and um, I worked there for six years. And I got to meet all of the CEOs of the most important companies in, in the country and in the world, um, which was a great experience. And I can probably call most of them up and they would still remember me because I've been in Arizona, or I've been in Montana for five years now. Um, I decided I wanted to move away from a bigger city. That still is becoming Beverly Hills, and I decided that um, I wanted something a little bit smaller. So I moved to Montana, and um, I got a job before I moved here with Pearson Design Group. And we do primarily residential, and it's rustic. Um, we like to do a little bit of modern, and we can, and we are kind of going towards that now. Um, but that's essentially it in a nutshell. What city in Arizona were you in? Scottsdale. Which one? Scottsdale? Scottsdale. Uh, so I'm Sky Anderson, and I'm from Whitefish, Montana. So I'm not far from home now. Uh, but I went to school in Seattle and got my bachelor's there at the Art Institute of Seattle. And when I was still in school, I uh, we had to do an internship as part of the program there. So I got also got a job in a show, which teaches you so much that you don't understand about the industry until you are in it. Um, so that was very important. And I was just filing fabrics and taking out the trash and you know, but you you see it and you're around it and you meet the designers and the people that are in the community. So it's a very important place, place to be and place to experience. Uh, after that I did a study abroad in France for three months. Anymore. <laughs> I'm done with that. <laughs> so then I just looked for another job. I was still in school and happened to find a job um, at an architecture and interior design firm that 
did a variety of things. Their main um, thing they did was biotech labs, which is not very much fun for interior design, but it was a job. Um, and, but we also did you know, some residential, some commercial restaurants, so I really got a lot of experience in different avenues of design, which was nice. Um, most of it was you know, more the not super high end, it was more normal people, you know, which was also nice to learn how to work on a budget and those kind of realities that a lot of clients do have. Um, then I worked there for a couple years and just decided I wanted to come back home. So I moved here about a year and a half ago and couldn't find a job. <laughs> and I ended up, I just, whatever I could find, I ended up getting a job at a tile shop in town, tile and plumbing. And that's actually why I have the job I have now because Rain comes into that shop and she, you know, I worked with her and she knew that I was efficient and, you know, kind of, she knew my personality that could get along so that when they needed somebody, she thought of me. So that's, it's something, it's very important to make connections. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, but I think a lot of times you get jobs from, you know, not necessarily what your background is or what your education does. I mean, obviously those come into play, but definitely making connections um, is very, very important in this industry. Uh, so I've been at Pearson Cyber for almost a year now. And as you can see, it's very rustic, but we're trying to slip some more in the because that's more of a you know, personal preference. Do <coughs> is it just residential? It has been so far, yeah. Anybody have a little bit of two questions? Anybody? <laughs> Tell us about the um, professional associations that your members of that are out there and are important for you. <coughs> One that I think is the broadest umbrella is the American Society of Interior Designers. And if you're interested in more information about it, ASAID.org is the source. Um, they have a very broad um, student support network as well as more local. Our local chapter, local, is all of Montana, Wyoming, Utah, and Idaho. <laughs> I was actually the first Montana president that they ever had because for years it was sort of centered out of Boise or Salt Lake. And then uh, the internet happened, which was a great thing for us. Um, You're the only Montana person, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, no. Actually, Patricia Nelson, before she left. Oh, okay. It was. Um, so, yeah, she was number two. <laughs> um, I think that the ASAD has been very beneficial, first of all, because it's a little bit of a watchdog in our profession about helping. Our, our profession is evolved a lot, and I won't bore you with the history, but basically we started out as a bunch of decorators a long time ago. Now we have folks that not only continue to do decoration, but design in the broader sense of the world, word, and most importantly, in, in this spectrum, when you're designing public spaces, when you're responsible for health, safety, and welfare of the public, that's a game changer. And so to that extent, most people don't even realize that in 26 states right now, designers are licensed in one form or another, different types of licensing, um, and because of their responsibility for the public health, safety, and welfare. So that's been, because of that, what that means for you is that there's opportunities to go into all kinds of different types of design. You've heard the tip of the iceberg here. A friend of mine that I graduated went on to work for McDonald's Corporation. She does McDonald's, which doesn't sound very glamorous, but they send her all over the world. And she gets to design the interiors of McDonald's in all kinds of places. The last I heard, she was in Russia. Um, so there's some avenues there. Um, there's, I know, a designer who does nothing but healthcare facilities, and that can be very personal and rewarding. I know a designer who does nothing but yachts down in Florida. Go for it. <laughs> um, that's got to be a lot of fun. So there's a lot of specialties that way. Or like um, many of us here, you can end up with a variety of different types of practice. So there's, there's depending on your personality and what you like to do, um, there's different aspects of design that you could be in as well. Um, I might also mention that there's design-related professions that don't necessarily mean that you're a designer. And some of us have alluded to that where we've been in internships or things where, um, for instance, 
working in the professional showrooms and wholesale showrooms, um, is, it's very important to have a design background. So you would be marketable to somebody like that because they need people who have that experience. Um, a lot of the reps, the representatives <coughs> the directors that call on us, um, they, if you like to travel, that's a job that you should consider. Most of the reps I talk to are out of Seattle, Salt Lake, Denver, and so they travel all around and represent everything from flooring manufacturers, fabric manufacturers, and they're people, they're people persons. <laughs> and um, the great majority of them, I think, have design backgrounds, some type of design education. Did you say you studied at the Chicago Art Institute? No. Um, I studied at Harrington Institute, which is in Chicago. The last I heard, the Chicago Art Institute really is still more in the fine arts. Yeah, just more mm -hmm. art. Right. Um, Harrington Institute <coughs> only taught in interior design. Oh. And so, yeah, that makes sense. Other associations or affiliations or? No, I'm not affiliate. I'm not an associate, but um, IIDA is another big national organization that tends to be a little, geared a little more commercially. Um, it's not very active in this region, and so there's not much benefit to be involved. And that's the, that's the tricky part with even ASID here. It's, it's a great organization, in my opinion, it's the, it's the big one to be a part of, but you have, you have to be a willing and able to travel a lot because there's not a lot of events in Montana. Right. So. And, and that, again, is all volunteer based. The challenge is we have the largest geographical chapter here in the country. And so we're not going to operate the way, uh, say, um, a Dallas chapter would where they can have monthly meetings and they all know each other because they can just drive over to wherever. Um, it just doesn't happen here. We usually have one yearly right. event. And that's huge for all of us to make because of the distances that we travel. Um, so the cool part about that, though, is what's evolving is now more and more there's more CEUs, continuing education classes that you can take online. So that totally works for me. And um, then there's also some different conferences that you can go to, and there's resources, and more and more of that is online, which for our chapter has been a real benefit. Um, I'm also a member of the Retail Design Institute. That's a little bit of a specialized market, but again, that's an area that I've been very passionate about and enjoyed, and so uh, that's a little bit more of a niche organization. When you say specialized, what do you mean? Um, it's specialized because it, it only deals with retail store design. And so oh, like I have to submit a portfolio and credentials. I've taken the NCIDQ, um, which is the, the, the professionals the profession qualifying exam for professional membership in a number of these organizations. It's a two-day exam. You have to have a certain amount of experience before you can even sit for it, depending on whether you have a BA or AA degree. But it's the benchmark for most of the professional organizations in terms of being admitted in professional staff. So what are you talking about? Showroom design? No, retail stores, like a retail store in a mall or a Disney <coughs> store. Or just setting up the No, the designing store? the whole store. I, oh, I, oh, yes. Everything from space planning, lighting yeah, design, designing the store fixture itself. design. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Other questions yet? <clears throat> you guys haven't thought of anything? I have a question. Do any of your companies have internships for interior designers, majors? We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Block to having an insurance? That's a good question. <laughs> I'd like to know the answer to that because as well. Because on this side, we'd like to be able to. Well, at least where I'm at, it has to do with um, strictly how busy we are. If we've got, if I'm, I'm busy, I, there, there used to be two designers that I was over, but now it's just me because of the economy. So. It just really depends if if we've got you know if I'm if I'm really busy I mean I could use one um, taking care of a lot of little details right now but I don't know if management would justify it. Yeah, it's it's really busy. Yeah. Is it because you feel that you would have to pay them? Yeah. So if they came in and said we will do three internships that would 
to be a game changer for you? It was actually probably. How about you, Joe? Maybe. Um, CJ doesn't doesn't like to. They feel obligated. So I think it's a yeah, it's maybe. If it frees you up, think of more exactly. billable hours you can have. <laughs> That's right. I can see it all working. <laughs> I think also, you know, when you, if you get those interviews where you are talking to the people for the possibility, um, just the openness to be kind of the peon and not take offense to that and say, I'll file fabrics, I'll take out the trash, I just want to be around it, and be totally open to it and not I guess, expect that you're necessarily going to be designing great things, but you're just going to be in it, you're going to be experiencing and learning, you know, from, from these companies. And I think that openness and willingness showing that to the employer might also be a kind of a good thing as well. I've had interns and my challenge is, and I'm, I'm happy to be a something because I, I just feel that that's the right thing to do. Um, the struggle for our program here is that it's a two-year program and so the intern really wants to happen in the summer between the first and second year but because especially because of the heavy amount of CAD work that my business entails due to the nature of it. One year of school is not enough CAD and I spent way too much time teaching to get any level of productivity at all and it was just really frustrating. And so and, and then the other part of that question and I don't know if this cap you know is a, is another difficult thing to address is it's really hard for me to take somebody on and give them 80 or 90 hours over a couple of months. I, I don't have to work to, to peak like that. I would probably be, it's, it would be a lot more interest or possible to have that internship spread out over, let's say maybe they only come in three or four hours a week where I can devote a little more time in that. If suddenly I have them there 20 or 40 hours a week, I, I just, I can't take that billable time away for, from deadlines as well. That, that was the struggle that I ran into. So, you know, ideally, after two years of CAD, their CAD skills should be good, but they're graduating. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Tell us about what an average typical day looks like for you. Like, you know, I'm sure everybody has this idea of what you do every day. What's it really like? <laughs> That's a good point. It really, it really varies. I think you know, some days you do sit at a computer more than you think you will. And that's probably the worst thing about the job. Um, you want to not be sitting at the computer. You want to be out doing things. You want to be learning new things, um, seeing people, and specifying product. And first of all, being in Montana, we don't have any showrooms here. So you're a little more isolated. And you do have to do everything online. We are shopping online all the time, and it's pretty much what we do all day long. Um, schedules, we do those as well uh, for plumbing, for lighting, for appliances, uh, for tile. Um, and then, so that's because we work for an architecture firm, we do everything um, from the ground up. So we come in when before they've even started construction. Um, but on a good day, and on a lot of days, like today, I was on a photo shoot all morning until about 2, and I had to run to a job site and um, run in there and you have 50 million people asking you questions because we have months to go before the house is complete and they're trying to do their job as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So um, it's a good day, but it's always hurried and you're always in a hurry and you're always on. So and Sky had a good day also. Yeah, uh, as she said, most days you sit at your computer all day long, but <laughs> other days, like today, boy, I'm wearing these hideous shoes and I was up on a job site all day and I came straight from the plane to here because, you know, it's just not stopped all day long. Um, and those are, you know, they're fun, exciting days and keep you inspired and keep going to get through all that computer time. <laughs> but, um, you know, I have a lot of background in working CAD, so I do um, work in CAD a lot. And as I mentioned, you know, you're shopping online a lot. Using Photoshop and InDesign in our firm, we use that daily. So those are good skills to have and to know how to use those programs. Um, again, not not very often do we 
I should say that. There's not a lot here to go see, to go shop for, to go do in my time, so that was difficult. You know, okay, then you get to buy some of the go to those shows. But mostly it's a <laughs> Being organized and <laughs> buying things. Do you ever travel to other showrooms in the physical so that you can have that experience and be more diverse? Like, where, where are the places closest to here that you would go? Like don't always go to the closest place. If we have clients that are in New oh, York, yeah. we'll go to the D&D building in New York City, um, <coughs> which is great fun because you get to spend a several yeah, days there. Yeah, I've been to these places. It's They're a, so much yeah, fun. It's an amazing um, couple of days. Your feet are very sore when you yeah. leave, but it's because it's go, 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 go. As much as you can cram it because you don't get much time. Yeah, but in the big cities, there's floors and floors. They're they're high rises. What what city were you just talking about? That was um, that was New York. Oh, you were from you're from New York, right? I am, but from upstate. Yeah. Still fun. <laughs> um, you know, I would I guess I would add to that. Um, you you find as an interior designer. And maybe more particularly in, a, in an architectural firm environment, you are juggling a lot of jobs. Um, I can think back at one point that I had 20 jobs in one phase or another of construction. You know, some were in the DD phase, some were in CD, and some were in CA phase. And so you just find, you've got to you've got to be as organized as possible. Uh, some days I wish I was more organized. If you took a look at my desk right now, um, but it it's uh, it can you know as, as you mentioned it can be a very it can be very exciting and very rewarding some days, and then some days you're you're just cranking it out you're just you, you'll go through a lot of these um, you're just you're just redlining stuff and you're inputting stuff in the computer you're looking up information you're documenting it and then you're checking it. Uh, to make sure that you're sending out good documents, um, but uh, the thing that's, that I find enjoyable about it overall is there's a lot of variety, and and you get some days you're out hustling, um, meeting clients, or you know selecting fixtures with the client, and some days you're sitting and you know drawing a, a very cool elevation of you know the hotel reception desk, you know so. Or, or detailing a, a really unique light fixture that you want to have hung above that desk. So it just depends on uh, what avenue you get into, but when you're doing sort of the full service interior design, um, you'll see a little bit of everything. It's, I, I find it to be, uh, I agree, a lot of the same some days, but, but then a lot of variety sometimes. You, know? you do a lot of client meetings, and, and you want to do the client meetings because you need to get that information from the client. You don't want it secondhand from an architect. You, you really want that face-to-face, -face, read their face, um, hear their words, um, feel their, the emotion, and you know, then, then it's more than what you wrote on the paper. You know what they want. But anyway. I would totally agree with all of my colleagues. Um, I think some of the most critical skills that I have are um, being organized because your clients expect you, and you have a responsibility here. If you communicate incorrect information, there could be serious financial consequences here. Um, you're, you're spending their money, and so you need to be extremely careful with that. If you're not an organized person, figure out a way to be organized, because that's a really important skill. Um, the other skill is just um, coordination. You're gonna be communicating, especially communication, not only listening to your client, but communicating well with others. Have you given the contractor the information that you need? Does your drawing reflect everything that it should? I mean, ideally, your information, you should be able to hand to somebody and not say a word, and they should be able to understand everything that they're seeing, which sometimes happens. One time I had a project where I had to send the drawings back to Atlanta, and I was not able to meet with the contractor. Um, we had a few um, phone calls. But um, basically, I had to make sure that I was absolutely as thorough as possible because there was that distance issue, and this was years before internet or anything like that. <coughs> so you have to be a good observer. You have to be a good detail person. I think that I was kind of joking earlier, but that's one of the holdovers from my early accounting experience that I actually appreciated was the level of detail. You're a detail person in whatever type of design you do. 
tend to add to all that is problem solving. Some days you can't get anything done because it's just email, phone call, it's probably not problem solving. Mm -hmm. You don't get anything done because you're problem solving all day long. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to you know, stay calm and make decisions and kind of just forge through it. And work really late because she didn't get anything done that day. <laughs> What is your favorite, your most favorite, and your least favorite part about your job, or, or any job in your field? Okay. <laughs> about your current employer field. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great when you know when your clients are excited and they love your ideas and they have money to execute them, and that's you know it's very exciting to see your ideas come to life. And to turn out as you thought they would, or even better. You know, it's very rewarding. And then I think there's, you know, maybe clients that don't have great taste, and we, and you can't convince them otherwise. And those are very <laughs> difficult people to deal with. And trying to come up with something that you can still be proud of and want to put your name on, but that they like to, you know, mm -hmm. that. So that's very challenging. Trying to sometimes I think the psychological and being able to talk well and convince people is it's very important. Um, I think the most rewarding is probably you know doing the photo shoots at the end and not um, seeing the truck, of course, um, and then also starting the job, you know, at the same time. So you're actually seeing something complete, you think it's beautiful, and then you're moving on. And we always try to do something very different for the next house. I don't like to put the same light fixture in the same house or in the next house. I don't like to put really anything. I don't want somebody to walk in and say, oh, I've seen this done before. And we struggle with trying to come up with new ideas and new product. And you're on blog sites all the time trying to see you know, what's new, and they're a great tool to use. Um, I think we have five of them that we check every single day in the morning. So it's, it really is an invaluable tool. Um, I think the, probably the least favorite thing is having personalities. Um, you don't always love your clients. And there are some that are very difficult to work for and with, and um, it's hard to always make them happy, no matter what. There are some people that have money that aren't always happy, and um, I don't know if you'll ever make them happy, but you just do the best thing, the best you can do, and it's really, you know, you can look at the overall scheme of things and the grand picture, and uh, in the end, it can always works. So. Uh, the, the ones that came to my mind initially was uh, I really enjoy the design process when I'm just sketching ideas and I'm just developing a concept and, and I'm just seeing the pieces fall into place. And there's just a point when you're designing something that it just clicks and you just feel like that's it. They're going to love this. And, you know, based on what they've told me, based on what I've seen from their their taste and um, um, I put a little spin on it and I think they're going to like this and I think I can sell it and and to me that's really rewarding and, and the fun part. Um, the other thing that is fun for me and I think it happens more, mostly on the residential jobs because when I'm doing a res residential project ty typically I'm um, in I've got the handle on most of the design in the house um, because I've, in, well, in most cases, brought that job into the office. Um, but I really, I really get a kick out of those days, and, and you, you two have sort of mentioned this a little bit, is when you're walking around with the contractor and sort of calling the shots on the job site, no, that soffit's not right, you need to, you know, it needs to be two inches bigger, or you need to, um, um, add some detail here, or this tile pattern is supposed to work like this in the bathroom, or you know, there's just a lot of lot of detail. And as they mentioned, sometimes those are busy, frantic days, but they're also um, rewarding to know that your design is being implemented properly, and you're working out the bugs. Sometimes you design it on paper, and then you go to the job site, and some things don't work. You know, you find that there was a slight flaw in what you. Uh, developed and you need to work the bugs out of that um, with the contractor. Um, so I find that rewarding. Mm -hmm.
actually probably my least favorite thing is when I have a contractor that's trying to do something not correct. I have to be the bad cop. You try and be diplomatic, but you know, <coughs> really, you really think you're going to get away with that? <laughs> Um, that's, that's not a fun conversation, you know, but my clients are paying me to watch out for them. And so that's, that's part of my job. But that's the least favorite. I think my favorite part is, I can think of two specifics. One for a retail store when the owner, after I came back in after about a month um, of him reopening, and he said his sales had jumped 27% and he hired another person. I was like, yeah. And then the other time was a very simple office, but the manager called me up and she said, you're not going to believe this, but my employees are so excited now that the office is remodeled, it looks so nice. And this was not an over-the-top remodel, it wasn't elaborate. Um, but it was just so much more professional, and I mean, these people had their computers on boxes, it was awful. She said they also had <coughs> dressing room because they decided the buzz was that management finally cared about. Um, I've learned more from receptionists when I walk into a project than almost anything else. If the receptionist ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Um, they'll often say, I remember walking into a beautiful building one time, and I said to the receptionist, oh, this is gorgeous, that I knew they had just moved in, and she said, yeah, but my desk doesn't work. And she proceeded to tell me everything that was wrong with her desk because nobody asked her what she needed. And so when my colleagues are talking about communication, that's really important. Um, because she here she's the frontline person for this whole company and she's trashing this, you know, this, because nobody asked her. Nobody cared in us to look in that direction. So we have to be good listeners and good communicators to make sure those folks are taken care of. Good question. Um, you, several of you have spoken about computer usage and so forth um, and different applications that you use. And the question might be a multiple part question. But one is, um, you know, we all understand that 2D line drawing, elevations, plan views, all that is part of the job. Then there, you, you mentioned Photoshop and other tools that you use. So my question would be, how much um, and where do you think it's going is the usage of computers to present your ideas via either crude things, maybe through SketchUp, using Photoshop with um, textures and so forth, and using perspective views all the way up to 3ds Max or doing surfacing in, in AutoCAD. You know, what level of tool, obviously, obviously each of those tools has a level of difficulty and expense in which one you choose to use. Um, do you find those useful in what you do? Is that something that's getting more useful and being used more than it has in the past? And which of those tools is kind of the one that would be the common one to use in the research? Does that make sense? Um, I have a small company of my own, so I have a smaller infrastructure than, say, uh, that Jeff has. My challenge is twofold. One is the training to use those programs. Um, do I hire somebody who has that training? Do I take time off to go back to school myself? That's a challenge. Oh, can I interrupt you just one second? Mm -hmm. so, the other thing I didn't mention is just handling it. It's handling it. It's still something. You do also with the cost. That's the, that's the second part of that. Um, is that the cost, is the cost, and is the client willing to pay for the time and effort to have that done? Um, most of the times when I've had hand rendering done, the artist who does it, I don't. It's not my strongest skill. Um, it's probably a way to start at $1,000. So how important is that rendering to the client? Um, and I work with the majority of the majority of my clients are smaller businesses. That's going to be a tough nut to crack. So, are you saying that having hand-drawn elements is more <coughs> expensive? It depends on your infrastructure, who you have in your company to do that, how well they're trained in those programs. Those programs are still emerging to be mainstream. Yeah, I, you know, I think related to the hand rendering, I still think, and it's it's partially because it's what I do more than anything, but because I, I can't CAD, CAD render. We have several people in our office that do um, amazing things with it, but I find the hand rendering, if it's done well, it's still the most romantic, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just draws people in in a way that I think a CAD, a CAD rendering can't. However, the CAD renderings make it look absolutely real now. You know, SketchUp is a little more on the crude side. It, it can be very detailed, but um, 
Studio Max? Yeah, three, three, yeah exactly. The 3D Studio Max is the one that we use for the real photorealistic renderings. Um, we've gotten to where our office here in Bozeman is, is almost all Rev Revit now instead of AutoCAD, so it's, there's even a switch there. And Revit is a program that's, um, you're basically drawing in 3D all the time. And so when you're, when you're forming a wall, you're forming every part of the wall, what the insulation inside the wall, the, the sheetrock on both sides, or the wood on one side and the sheetrock on the other, the height of the wall. Um, and so when it's drawn, you can immediately turn it into a 3D image. And there's, a, there's some efficiencies to that, and that's why we've, we've gone that direction in this office. Um, but a lot of our other offices don't use it, and they struggle with the idea of using it. So it just depends. Um, Teresa might know this firm, but I've heard, I've heard stories that there's a firm in Seattle that's paperless. That they're, and I, do you know which firm that was? No, but uh, if, I, if you give me a little bit of time, I can probably Sure. Um, but, so there, so there are some firms that are going that way. You know, everybody's thinking green in this industry. It's we, we kind of have to. I think residential lags behind a little bit because we're, you know, typically when a client can afford a designer, um, they usually have a lot of money, and so you end up doing around the residential side typically higher end projects, and they want a lot of detail and and some extreme materials sometimes, and um, sometimes you can't get super green with some of that. Sometimes you can, and some projects warrant that and require that, but I'm kind of going off subject again from your question. But yeah, Photoshop gets used a lot in our office. Um, Revit gets used every day. Uh, 3ds Max for the really detailed renderings, and uh, as you said, they're just absolutely Realistic. I mean, they take a, they take they'll go to the job site, take a picture of the mountains for the background, the app, the actual setting that it's in, and then create the building so it looks completely built. They scan in the materials of the brick or the stone or the wood, um, the copper, what, whatever's on it, and it looks like it's already been built. So. Uh, they, they're, uh, it's pretty incredible. I'm sure you've all seen some of that, but the technology, yeah, it just continues to amaze me. So, and it gets used all the time in Montana. So. And in our office, we use um, InDesign all the time, um, every day. We put all of our furniture, um, tile, plumbing, lighting, everything in InDesign. Um, of course, we're in an architecture firm, so we had to use the time. But we did have someone that worked for us, and all he did all day long was renderings. And um, they sold so many projects for us. So, I mean, if you're a great renderer, you can get a job. And in a lot of places, I'm sure you can get a job, and that's all you do. So, I think it's beautiful. It's absolutely stunning. Whenever you see a presentation that has hand renderings in it, it, it far supersedes just about anything. I think any program you can learn or know about is just going to make you more valuable. Um, you know, obviously, CAD. Uh, I just we mentioned you know, Photoshop and design that we use every day. Those, I think, are just good tools for many trades to know the basics of. <coughs> just, I think if you, obviously, if you can hand render, that's the preference. But if you know you struggle a little bit, SketchUp is great to know because you can trace over it. You know, just uh, those are probably the main ones that we use. Our architects do some of the more you know, advanced programs. I haven't personally had the need to know how to use those yet, but as I said, if you have a kind of hurt to know them, if you have the opportunity to learn them, you'll be more valuable. So. Yeah, Sky, right. Sky made a good point that the, uh, just to elaborate on a little bit, if that's okay, just, um, programs like SketchUp. You can be pretty detailed with those if you're really good at it, but if you just have a basic understanding of the program, it's pretty intuitive to just draw the basic shapes. So if you want to do a 3D rendering, a hand-drawn rendering, it's kind of nice to be able to just quickly pop the shapes into SketchUp, and then you just get your trace paper out and trace those lines, and that gives you your basic perspective 
of the of the image, and then you can just start adding detail. So it's kind of a nice tool. So it's kind of a composite of hand drawing and um, computer drawing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's just one way to kind of help you get a true perspective rather than messing with your vantage point and you know really yeah, set more it out. Yeah, you just get more accurate. It's, kind of, it's just kind of a trick that people. Do you make. like the way that looks? Yeah, because yeah. really you're you're taking a you're plugging in the exact size of the room. Yeah. And maybe the exact size of the casework or the exact size of the soffits or whatever you're designing. And then it, and it puts it in 3D for you. So then you just trace those basic lines, mm -hmm. and then you come back and add all the detail that you want. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then the, the romantic, cultural, artistic part is there, but it's so accurate. Yeah. I like that idea. It just depends on what your firm is. Yeah. Like, it, like, because I'm so small, I tend to farm it out. Somebody who does that, whether it's CAD rendering or hand rendering, because I don't really have time right now to go back to school to learn that. That would be really hard for me. So at least to the degree that I'd like to see it done, it makes more sense. And it depends on the client. If you have wealthy clients, yeah, that's you know, then you have some leverage there. A lot of yeah. times small businesses, you're really on the tight budget, you may or may not have that. Ability. Yeah, I guess it just depends on what's appropriate because it sounds like in interior design it's moving more toward a composite of all these technologies plus you know the culture of an actual hand drawing. In fact, Nate Burkus, who has a show, the interior design show, the Nate Burkus show, he's one of the foremost interior designers in America. And I was predicting this would happen, but he quickly went back to hand drawings and um, I don't know what you call those, where you just have the, the couch, this like, you know, you move everything around, like those magnets to keyboard you when you're a job. But he does that in a large scale on his TV show because it actually, just for that application, makes more sense when he's sitting there talking with someone and he just moves around with his hands. So I can, it seems to me it's moving toward like whatever works whatever's most appropriate in, in the application, a composite of all these things together. I, I like that idea, culturally, because I'm an artist and I like sketches and they're beautiful. Yeah, I think it, it, it goes even beyond rendering. Is that, you know, we all are going to present finishes to clients. And you just, over time, you develop things that you enjoy. The things that you think well, that sold the client the last 10 times I did it, so I'm going to do it again. And sometimes you want to be unique and different and present uh, you know, one of our designers in Missoula um, office was telling me, I don't know, a year ago, I think, that she had presented all of her finishes on an old window she picked up at a store and just hot glued them all to this old antique window <laughs> because it sort of fit the project. It's charming. And it's charming. It's right. interesting. But um, there's all sorts of different little tricks that you learn and things that you try and sometimes they're, they're great, sometimes they're okay and occasionally they fail, but you, you know, you just, you just try all these different, um, um, you, you use the resources that you have at hand and then you just try different things and, and you're really trying to sell your concepts to a client. And yeah, and I think the success of it is, is it appropriate? Is it what your client likes? Because for me, I would like to see hand drawings and sketches mixed in with all the other things. That's my taste. If I was a client, I would just enjoy that. And I think a lot of clients would also like that. Some might not, but it depends on what's appropriate to the client. Yeah, and if it's a residential project and you're just helping them redo a bathroom or a kitchen design or something, you might, you might not be able to justify a rendering you know you might you might have three thousand dollars three thousand dollars to work with and and you might show them a quick elevation of each casework you know each wall in the cat in the kitchen and and add enough detail and some notes and uh, just to really get the idea across is there any other last questions um, what skills or attributes are, would you be looking for in any potential employees that you would hire? What? Like, what skills or attributes would you be looking for in any potential employees? Well, certainly any additional software knowledge that you have in some of these programs that we're talking about is, I think, a plus. 
um, CAD is more e of basic. Um, but I think it becomes more intangible because if you're right out of school, we don't expect you to know a lot. I don't mean that to sound deferential but, um, or, or deprecating, but, but what we expect is the attitude. Uh, you're going to get in there, you're going to work hard, you're going to have a lot of enthusiasm, you're going to be detailed, you're going to be conscientious. Um, if, if you have the right attitude, we can teach you. And we know we're going to do that. It's the attitude that's really critical. And I think I would add to that an attitude that lasts more than six months or a year. You know, <coughs> you, you want to you want to have that. I'm here to learn attitude for sometimes several years. You know, because sometimes you have to be really patient, and probably in every profession, to gradually creep up the um, the, uh, the scale to get where you want to be and. So I'd, I'd say be patient, but have, have a good attitude for a while. I think it's great to be well-rounded as well. I think that when you start a job or go for an, um, an interview, it's, it's good not to just tell them the things that you've done related to material design, but if you've traveled, um, you know, just all the different things that you've, you've done you know, for family as a kid, or um, you want to get to a point where you work with really wealthy people, and you want to be able to talk to them. Um, and there are things that, you know, even though we're not wealthy, it's if you're well-rounded, if you've traveled a little bit, um, well-versed in, you know, art and literature, I think that that helps to speak to people. Um, it's, it's definitely something you want to you let an employer know. That's an excellent point. Okay, I don't want to cut anybody off. Did you have one more question? No, that's okay. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm sure these guys would be happy to answer any questions afterwards as well. So, um, from the Career One Stop website, just national statistics, well, so Montana and, and national statistics, median wages, um, and this is across the board, it's not entry level. So, and they're median wages, so that means 50% of the respondents make more, 50% less. And then the forecast, the growth forecast for interior designs is actually looking pretty good.